Rudy Kormani was one of the founding fathers of the ESDR in 1970. Notice a 50 year anniversary is coming up in two years for the ESDR. Rudy Kormani was a Dutch working in Utrecht and Leiden. His research concerned primarily immune mediated diseases and photochemotherapy. The most prestigious lecture of the ESDR is named after him. It is given by an internationally recognized individual who has made a significant contribution to the ESDR and who has carried out high quality science relevant to dermatology. Let us come to this year's awardee. We are extremely delighted that Dr. Thilo Biedermann has accepted our invitation. Dr. Biedermann is Chair of Dermatology at the Technical University in Munich. He is past president of the ESDR. He presided over a very memorable ESDR meeting in Venice in 2012. Despite of his administrative responsibilities, he continues to publish very prominently and uh, very well cited. As you will hear from him in a minute, he does cutting edge work on various aspects of immune regulation in the skin, covering both innate and adaptive immunity. Tilo, we are delighted that you're here. The stage is yours. Matthias, thank you very much for these very nice words. I'm very honored, deeply touched to have been invited to give this lecture. Um, those of you who are not so familiar with the ESDR, the Rudy Kormani lecture um, is maybe not so much a keynote science lecture, but it's more kind of a personal approach to dermatologic science and uh, maybe uh, trying to be a role model also for young researchers. And this is how I also interpreted um, this lecture. So how do I move this on? back? Green one. Green one, yes. So sorry. So this was, um, this was the disclosure. I would like to start with Rudy uh, Kormani and the ESDR. Um, Rudy Kormani sadly died at a rather young age uh, in 1987. And in 1987, I was still a medical student, so I did not meet him personally. So I, when I was invited, I talked to uh, different people about Rudy Kormani, and among them was this gentleman. I don't know if you recognize him. I, I know him more like this, and I know him like this for a long time. So that's Professor Gerd Plevik. And he told me a lot about Rudy Kormani, and I was very impressed also by what other people said. Besides, Professor Gerd Plevik is kind of a, a private historian in regard to dermatology. And he has this box, and in his box, he, in this box, he, he collected all the program books of all the ESDR meetings that he went to. And among them is the one of the first. It was founded in 1970, and this is the meeting in 71, and you can recognize Rudy Kormani was the treasurer back then. And he was the treasurer for many years until he became president. And in this function, he worked a great deal for the founding of this society. I also found this program book, which is interesting. It's the third meeting of the European Society of Dermatological Research. And here they, they cite that the second meeting was actually a joint meeting between the SID and the ESDR. And this is Rudy Kormani, another picture that Gerd Plevik gave to me. And he said, this is the picture that really tells you a lot about him. A well-educated, scientifically thinking, fair, and gentle man. And he could also have fun. And I, I like to, to share these pictures with you when they met after you know, their um, scientific meetings. And then I found this um, when Gerd Plevik was president of the ESDR, this program book of another joint meeting between the SID and the ESDR. And I found this because this was in 1983 in Washington, DC. And in 1983, I was a foreign exchange student in Phoenix, Arizona, graduating from high school, uh, far away from dermatology, but 
sad enough, this is 35 years ago. So with this picture of Rudy Kormani, I want to honor also this man who's done so much for, bio for the cutaneous biology research and for the society. And I'm very and deeply honored um, to have been invited to give this lecture. So what is this title, Above and Beyond, New Frontiers in Cutaneous Immunology? When I was this exchange student in the US, um, New Frontiers actually became a term that I first recognized as important because I had to pass American history to be able to graduate from high school and New Frontiers was really a term that was used a lot. And this term came to my mind when I was in medical school and I asked myself, what are the new frontiers in my life? What are the new frontiers in my professional life that I want to be working with? And it ended up to be the combination of immunology and dermatology. As a student, I came in contact with Professor Otto Braun Falco, an enthusiastic and motivating teacher who sadly passed away a month ago in the age of 95. And Gep Levig became my uh, clinical teacher and mentor with a well-structured dermatology. But then I think the most important part was meeting this person. I don't know if you can recognize who this is, dancing at the SID in Phoenix. This is Professor Martin Röcken. And he came back, actually I was in the last year of medical school on, on the dermatology ward, and he came back from the NIH and the whole world was explained by the yin-yang concept of TH1 and TH2. And among the first papers that he gave to me to read is this hallmark paper uh, describing TH1 and TH2 clones by uh, Tim Mossman and Bob Kaufman. So with these experiences and, and these people that I met, I knew my theme is set. I want to combine immunology and dermatology. And of course, the dominant disease to be looked into was psoriasis. And looking into psoriasis with this TH1, TH2 concept, it was interpreted as being TH1 mediated and TH2 cells should be able to suppress this disease. And uh, especially IL-4 as being the, the most dominant, uh, functionally dominant cytokine. And this was my first project. I established a delayed type hypersensitivity response to TNCB, and indeed there was a dose-dependent amelioration of the disease, not just suppression, but a modulation of the disease. And Martin took this further, took it to the clinic and treated patients with IL-4, and psoriasis cleared. However, over time, there was more and more evidence showing that it may not just be TH1, but it may be TH17 cells and the driving cytokine IL-23 that are important for disease development. And so we went back into these samples of the study and stained for IL-23, IL-17, and we found the treatment actually ameliorated these cytokines and going into the mechanisms we identified that IL-4 selectively shut down IL-23 in antigen-presenting cells. Highly potent no level left of this cytokine. And of course, the uh, subsequent exposure of T cells to these antigen presenting cells shut off the IL-17 message. So that means actually IL-4 was maybe one of the first biologics that targeted this potent pathway of psoriasis being IL-23 IL and IL-17 driven um, and that are now the, the uh, most potent biologics that we have in the clinics. However, it was hard to publish, I, I have to say, and, um, and we had to add um, chimeric mouse models to really prove that it's uh, the specific targeting of dendritic cells um, and the shutting off of IL-23. And when it came out, I realized that the editor was Bob Kaufman. And I was, I, I, first I understood why it took longer to really, you know, uh, make him believe that this is correct, and then I was proud that he finally let us go and publish this paper. Another moment of being proud was this first plenary talk I had at the ESDR. It was also kind of my first story, where I started to look around T cells, the up and downstream cells that would um, carry out the inflammation, and, and I found that mast cells are very important um, deliverers of TNF in the delay type hypersensitivity response 
And these are, these are the slides uh, that I took with me when I gave this talk. And I was even more proud that this story was actually accepted at the Journal of Experimental Medicine the same year. And I think this is one of these decision points where you know, first, your decision was right. You, this is what you want to do. It's fun to go into academia. And yes, I want to keep on doing this um, because it is so much fun. And it's the new frontiers that you want to, um, that you want to follow. Actually, there is an ongoing story that we work on with mast cells. When I did my training in dermatopathology, I realized that around and in melanomas, there's quite a few mast cells, especially in those that show immune regression. And so we set up a model, and Susanne Kessler um, did this work, um, showing that mast cells actually can be switched into an anti-tumorogenic immune cell that mediates uh, immune control of melanomas. And this is by recruiting tumor-specific T cells. And the most important mediator derived of mast cells is the chemokine CXCL10. So mast cells are recruited to the tumor probably to help the tumor grow, produce growth factors, angiogenic factors. But then you can target these mast cells and turn them against the tumor. And importantly, if you go into databases, CXCL10 is a very important biomarker showing good survival rates in the patients that show these high uh, loads of CXCL10 in the primary tumor. But then I increasingly switched the level of immune investigations to the level of cutaneous immune sensing and understanding the downstream consequences. This happened also through this work um, where we understood that IL-4 is a very, ply very pleiotropic cytokine that if you dominate a microenvironment in an antigen-presenting cell and then target it, for example, by activating toll-like receptor 9, these dendritic cells suddenly produce a lot of interleukin-12. And this allows bulb C mice that are susceptible, systemic to systemic even, Leishmanias infections, to clear this infection. Understanding that not only one cytokine can have pleiotropic effects, but also several signals that come in and regulate antigen-presenting cells may regulate contrary immune uh, qualities. And with this work probably in mind, I was invited for my first invited lecture to the ESDR. I was invited to uh, give a lecture in the postgraduate course, this is now the Frontiers Lectures, on toll-like receptors. And I included, I included work that, uh, that of papers that we've been reading in the Journal Club, for example, Jules Hoffman showing that in the absence of toll, Drosophila would die from fungal infections. Or work from Bruce Beutler showing that LPS is ligand for toll-like receptor 4. And then, of course, it touched me in a special way that these two gentlemen, Jules Hoffman and Bruce Beutler, were awarded with the Nobel Prize in 2011, showing how close we are to uh, the new frontiers that are studied and awarded. And even more so, I was proud that we had Bruce Beutler as our guest speaker in the ESDR meeting in Venice in 2012. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper into cutaneous immune sensing and the consequences that we've discovered. And one example is the yin and yang of TLR2 mediated immune reactions that I want to present to you. And then a little later, where we are heading now, breaking immune tolerance through the skin. So let's start with the TLR2 mediated uh, immune sensing. In this meeting, and in the meetings of the last years, a lot of research on the cutaneous microbiome is presented. And we understand today that there's different habitats, that there is a highly complex ecosystem, and that delivers an array of ligands for pathogen recognition receptors. We also understand, and this is work from uh, Yasmin Belkaid's group, that in the absence of cutaneous microbes, the immune system doesn't function. You need microbes, in this case, association with staph epidermidis, to mount an IL-17 dominated immune response. In the absence of these microbes, uh, a later infection with candida cannot be defeated. And this work by Heidi Kong and Julie Segre shows that, and you all know this, um, with the flare in atopic dermatitis, there's a complete breakdown of the diversity of the microbes on the skin 
now being completely dominated by Staph aureus. And I like to see this work because we have for many years been studying the different ligands that come off the wall of Staphylococcus aureus. Um, work I will not show uh, due to time reasons on lipotachyoic acid, uh, on peptidoglycan and also lipoproteins. And this is what I want to present to you now in some examples. Susanne Kessler set up a model where um, there was a pure Th2 mediated skin inflammation uh, in the mouse. This is self-limiting, only lasting for two days as you can uh, see in the black line. Then we exposed these mice cutaneously to uh, a TLR2 ligand, the lipopeptide, PAM2, only one time. And this transferred the cutaneous inflammation from a two-day self-limited inflammation into a chronic two-week lasting dermatitis. And in, as underlying mechanism, we identified that actually the AL10 message was completely shut off. The normal response to TLR2 ligands is an upregulation of IL-10. However, in the presence of IL-4, this IL-10 is completely gone. So this is why I think that the new treatment that we have for atopic dermatitis, blocking the immune functions of IL-4, also regulates the direct consequences of the microbial dysbiosis on the skin and the immune consequences within the skin as being one of the pathogenic factors that are, um, that are cured with this treatment. Another yin and yang of TLR2. Julia Skabitska in my lab had the project to analyze whether the exposure to Staph aureus is actually a vaccination for chronic atopic dermatitis. And so she set up the AD-like model, um, the contact hypersensitivity to FITS, and exposed the skin to Staph aureus by colonizing it. And then she me measured the ear swelling a week later. And to our surprise, she found that there was a significant suppression of the ear swelling after these mice have been exposed to Staph aureus. Of course, I didn't believe it, and so she had to show it to me a couple of times. Then we went on to understand whether TLR2 ligands can also do the job. There's TLR2 ligands activating the heterodimer 1-2, and there's TLR2 ligands that activate the heterodimer of TLR2 and 6. And only the latter can suppress the immune responses consequently whereas the TLR1-2 ligand do not. Julia found that actually the spleens of these mice were enlarged. And when she analyzed these spleens, she identified a prominent cell group called myeloid-derived suppressor cells. We know these cells from tumor immunology because they potently suppress anti-tumor T-cell-mediated immune responses. And she found them now in these mice and also in the skin of the suppressed immune responses. And the whole story is um, that the TLR2 ligands induce high levels of IL-6 in the keratinocytes. These levels are so high that they become systemic, they induce the maturation, the expansion, and accumulation of myeloid-derived suppressor cells also in the skin. And this suppresses subsequent immune responses. And most importantly, these cells can also be found in patients with severe atopic dermatitis in the blood and in the skin and most prominently in those that develop eczema hepaticum, a severe, severe comorbidity due to immune suppression in these patients. As a third approach, we wondered many years ago whether the tolerogenic, the normal, the homeostatic immune response to commensal and non-pathogenic bacteria could be enhanced therapeutically to balance chronic inflammation. And way before the microbiome was such a hype. We used lysates of gram-negative bacteria and applied them to the skin of patients with atopic dermatitis, receiving significant responses and most importantly showing a significant intergroup difference at the end of a one-month treatment. So lysates of bacteria can cure, modulate disease. And Thomas Falls looked into the mechanism underlying these effects and he identified that actually these lysates potently induce IL-10 in antigen-presenting cells and downstream of these in T cells. So this disbalance um, of reduced IL-10, um, he could uh, supplement this 
by inducing AL10 again with these lysates of, of gram-negative bacteria. So this correction is possible, either by reducing inflammation or by upregulating tolerogenic immune responses. And maybe this morning you've seen the presentation from Rich Gallo's group where they use um, staphylococci that reduce Staphylococcus aureus, so they reduce the inflammatory part by using microbes, and this very recent publication used gram-negative um, Rosemonas mucosa to transplant on the skin and to ameliorate atopic dermatitis inflammatory skin lesions. So I think there's a lot of perspective of this work, um, and we will see more of that in the future. Now, and this will be my last point, I want to talk to you about breaking immune tolerance through the skin. And um, with this, we made it in, into a highly read publication. Um, the, the News Weekly, the Spiegel, the, the most uh, read um, weekly news in Germany, uh, we had uh, a one-pager uh, called The Last Supper. The Last Supper because patients that are affected by this disease would in the morning wake up with hives even anaphylactic responses after they had their last supper in the evening. And I want to talk to you about what, ticks play, uh, what role ticks play in this, um, in this disease. First, I have to introduce uh, a carbohydrate, galactose, alpha-1,3 galactose. It is uh, a glycosylation that is found on many proteins, many lipids. But about 25 million years ago, a mutation that occurred in old world primates um, made these primates unable to produce this carbohydrate. And since we are, since we are descendants of these old world um, monkeys, we also cannot produce this glycosylation. That means we all are knockouts for alpha-gal. And this means it's Im an immunogenic carbohydrate. And 1% of your immunoglobulin production is directed against alpha-gal. We made it all through evolution with this production of antibodies against alpha-gal, and the reason for that is still not clear. So is it the world against us, or we against the world? Interestingly, and this is rather new, IgE antibody production is possible. And it can be directed against immunoglobulins because mammalian immunoglobulins also have these alpha-gal residues. And this was shown by this paper where Tom Blatt's Mills group um, showed that people with anaphylaxis to uh, after uh, getting uh, cetuximab actually get this anaphylaxis because this humanized antibody still carries alpha-gal residues and they have preformed IgE antibodies and developed this anaphylaxis. And one year later, he described that actually these patients suffer from another disease, a new entity called delayed anaphylaxis to red meat. And these patients develop angioedema hives in the night after their last supper. And when, this, when I read this publication, I immediately realized that I had these patients. I took care of these patients, and we could not find the eliciting antigen in these patients because we were looking for proteins. But it's not proteins eliciting it, it's a carbohydrate. So we collected these patients and characterized them deeply in the clinics, and we could, by using oral provocation tests, induce hives, induce anaphylaxis after they eat, for example, meat or uh, pork kidney. Tom Blatt's Mills Group also published that they think this disease is especially prevalent in the southeast of the US because this is where the ticks are. And they found patients that increased their IgE antibodies towards ticks after they have been stung again uh, in, in, in the last season. So we did a study, and this is Jörg Fischer's work, where we investigated about 1,000 uh, individuals, a third of them being hunters and forest workers. And the highest determinant of developing this allergy towards alpha-gal is atopy. So the genetic susceptibility to develop IgE antibodies is the highest uh, determinant for this disease. And the second highest, almost equal determinant, is tick bites within the last 12 months. 
And this is why I think this is so important, because tick bites are happening through the skin. And in, also in our um, patients that we take care of, if there is no tick bite in the last year, no increase of IgE antibodies, if there is tick bites, the response is going up and IgE antibodies develop. We even have one patient that develops systemic reactions to tick bites. And the most recent patient I saw in Munich is we did an oral provocation test and he developed a recall urticaria in his previous tick bites, finally proving that actually tick bites and this disease are uh, a joint appearance. We characterized this disease more deeply. We know that innards like poor kidneys can elicit anaphylaxis. Actually, three gram in some patients are enough to develop, for them to develop severe anaphylaxis. Gelatin containing fluids for infusion or even gelatin containing sweets in some patients can elicit anaphylaxis. And where's the perspective here? I think the perspective here is that we have to understand better how carbohydrates are translated into immune responses. We are so much exposed to that. And I think the skin, by receiving tick bites and bites of other insects, um, is a translator of these signals to our immune system. So we have now alpha-gal knockout mice in the lab, and we have now established a percutaneous induction of IgE responses that respond into anaphylaxis. Um, and the first grant is now secured, so we can go into basic science research. The other perspectives that I see, of course, we need to better exploit the cutaneous immune system for anti-tumor immune responses. The up and going hype for anti-tumor uh, immunotherapy will still be ongoing, and I think dermatology can contribute a great deal to the development of the new therapies. And last but not least, I think um, we need to better understand the cutaneous barrier to develop better treatments for disease, but also preventions, and this is where I see the new frontiers. We and others have recently published papers trying to actually fuse the knowledge uh, on the different levels of the cutaneous barrier to better understand how we can also interfere and better regulate it. We used to be thinking of the cutaneous barrier of a chemical barrier, the acid, acid, acidic um, mantle of the skin, the physical barrier. But today we need to understand that actually it's a very complex network. The microbiome is part of the cutaneous barrier. It's a very complex ecosystem, and it translates into the quality of the chemical, of the physical, and of the immune barrier of the skin. And we understand today that changing one of these levels responds into dysbiosis of the skin, into disrupted immune responses, and it is a very complex but highly attractive field to better understand of how we can interfere into this complex system. And I brought you an example of TLR2, one of the recognition receptors that we have on keratinocytes, on immune cells. And I wanted to transport to you how complex already one single recognition pathway is and how diverse the cutaneous immune responses that can happen. In this review, we pointed out how this combinatorial system actually opens uh, the um, the perspective for immune responses that are possible downstream. So to conclude at this point, yes, there is a lot of immune sensing in the skin and we already do understand much better what is happening. The danger part was the first one that we understood. It induces inflammation. However, the other part, the inapparent activation, that is a part that we need to understand much better. Signals for stability. Inflammation is good for immune defense against infections, but also against tumors, and the backside is chronic inflammatory skin diseases. But we want to exploit the mechanisms that we understand to better fight melanomas, to rebalance the chronic inflammation, um, for example, in atopic dermatitis. And we also understand that there is systemic inflammation, and we need to also control and, and have a, a deeper look at the systemic inflammation because it can lead to suppression. And we want to much better understand the signals that are necessary to induce homeostasis, to establish a stable barrier, 
but also to induce tolerance um, so that um, we can prevent disease. And my new frontier is the tick bite induced breaking of tolerance to better understand of how the skin is used to vaccinate for allergies and how we could, how we could prevent this uh, from happening. So at this point, I want to thank you for your attention, but I want to um, very um, much thank all the people that have been um, influencing me, that have been mentors, that have been co-workers, that have been in the groups I work with. It's all about people at the end. And without these people, I would not be standing up here. And I want to really deeply thank them for their contributions, for their friendship, for their collegiality. Um, it has been a great experience, always. And of course, we need to thank uh, the grants. You know, without money, no research. So I want to thank them. I want to thank my family that moved around with me and still is happy, um, makes me happy. And I want to thank, last but not least, the ESDR for being such a great society, um, for letting me be part of them, being their president. So thank you very much for your attention. Tilo, thank you for this outstanding lecture. I'm delighted uh, to pre present to you, on behalf of the ESDR, the Rudy Kormani Lectureship Certificate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.